In mathematical logic, the theory of infinite sets was first developed by Georg Cantor. Although this work has become a thoroughly standard fixture of classical set theory, it has been criticized in several areas by mathematicians and philosophers. Cantor's theorem implies that there are sets having cardinality greater than the infinite cardinality of the set of natural numbers. Cantor's argument for this theorem is presented with one small change. This argument can be improved by using a definition he gave later. The resulting argument uses only five axioms of set theory. Cantor's set theory was controversial at the start, but later became largely accepted. In particular, there have been objections to its use of infinite sets. Cantor's argument Cantor's first proof that infinite sets can have different cardinalities was published in 1874. This proof demonstrates that the set of natural numbers and the set of real numbers have different cardinalities. It uses the theorem that a bounded increasing sequence of real numbers has a limit, which can be proved by using Cantor's or Richard Dedekind's construction of the irrational numbers. Because Leopold Kronecker did not accept these constructions, Cantor was motivated to develop a new proof. In 1891, he published a much simpler proof, which does not depend on considering the irrational numbers. His new proof uses his diagonal argument to prove that there exists an infinite set with a larger number of elements or greater cardinality than the set of natural numbers n. Topic 1 2 3 This larger set consists of the elements x1, x2, x3 where each xn is either m or w. Each of these elements corresponds to a subset of n, namely the element x1, x2, x3 corresponds to an element of n, xn. W. So Cantor's argument implies that the set of all subsets of n has greater cardinality than n. The set of all subsets of n is denoted by phosphorus mononitride, the power set of n. Cantor generalized his argument to an arbitrary set A and the set consisting of all functions from A to 0, 1. Each of these functions corresponds to a subset of A, so his generalized argument implies the theorem, the power set P A has greater cardinality than A. This is known as Cantor's theorem. The argument below is a modern version of Cantor's argument that uses power sets for his original argument, see Cantor's diagonal argument. By presenting a modern argument, it is possible to see which assumptions of axiomatic set theory are used. The first part of the argument proves that N and phosphorus mononitride have different cardinalities. There exists at least one infinite set. This assumption not formally specified by Cantor is captured in formal set theory by the axiom of infinity. This axiom implies that n, the set of all natural numbers, exists. Phosphorus mononitride, the set of all subsets of n, exists. In formal set theory, this is implied by the power set axiom, which says that for every set there is a set of all of its subsets. The concept of having the same number or having the same cardinality can be captured by the idea of one-to-one -one correspondence. This purely definitional assumption is sometimes known as Hume's principle. As Frege said, if a waiter wishes to be certain of laying exactly as many knives on a table as plates, he has no need to count either of them, all he has to do is to lay immediately to the right of every plate a knife, taking care that every knife on the table lies immediately to the right of a plate. 
plates and knives are thus correlated one to one. Sets in such a correlation are called a quinumerous, and the correlation is called a one-to-one -one correspondence. A set cannot be put into one-to-one -one correspondence with its power set. This implies that N and phosphorus mononitride have different cardinalities. It depends on very few assumptions of set theory, and, as John P. Maybury puts it, is a simple and beautiful argument that is pregnant with consequences. Here is the argument: let a display style a be a set and p. A display style P A be its power set. The following theorem will be proved if f display style f is a function from a display style A to P A display style P A then it is not onto. This theorem implies that there is no one-to-one -one correspondence between a display style a and p a display style p a, since such a correspondence must be onto. Proof of theorem: Define the diagonal subset d equals x element of a x f x display style d equals x in a x note in f x since d element of p a display style d in p a proving that for all x element of a d does not equal f x display style x in a d n e q f x will imply that f display style f is not onto let x element of a display style x in a then x element of d x f x display style x in d left right arrow x note in f x which implies x D x element of f x display style x note and d left right arrow x in f x. So if x element of d display style x in d, then x f x display style x note in f x and if x d display style x note in d then x element of f x display style x in f x since one of these sets contains x display style x and the other does not d does not equal f x display style d n e q f x therefore d display style d is not in the image of f display style f so f display style f is not onto 
Next cantor shows that a display style a is a quinumerous with a subset of p a display style p a from this and the fact that p a display style p a and a display style a have different cardinalities he concludes that p a display style p a has greater cardinality than a display style a this conclusion uses his 1878 definition if a and b have different cardinalities then either b is a quinumerous with a subset of a in this case b has less cardinality than a or a is a quinumerous with a subset of b in this case b has greater cardinality than a this definition leaves out the case where a and b are a quinumerous with a subset of the other set that is, A is a quinumerous with a subset of B and B is a quinumerous with a subset of A because Cantor implicitly assumed that cardinalities are linearly ordered, this case cannot occur. After using his 1878 definition, Cantor stated that in an 1883 article he proved that cardinalities are well ordered, which implies they are linearly ordered. This proof used his well ordering principle. Every set can be well ordered, which he called a law of thought. The well ordering principle is equivalent to the axiom of choice. Around 1895, Cantor began to regard the well ordering principle as a theorem and attempted to prove it. In 1895, Cantor also gave a new definition of greater than. That correctly defines this concept without the aid of his well ordering principle. By using Cantor's new definition, the modern argument that phosphorus mononitride has greater cardinality than N can be completed using weaker assumptions than his original argument. The concept of having greater cardinality can be captured by Cantor's 1895 definition, B has greater cardinality than A if 1 A is a quinumerous with a subset of B, and 2 B is not a quinumerous with a subset of A clause 1 says B is at least as large as A, which is consistent with our definition of having the same cardinality. Clause 2 implies that the case where A and B are a quinumerous with a subset of the other set is false. Since clause 2 says that A is not at least as large as B, the two clauses together say that B is larger has greater cardinality than A. The power set P A display style P A has greater cardinality than A display style A which implies that phosphorus mononitride has greater cardinality than N. Here is the proof. Besides the axioms of infinity and power set, the axioms of separation, extensionality, and pairing were used in the modern argument. For example, the axiom of separation was used to define the diagonal subset D D the axiom of extensionality was used to prove D does not equal F X display style D n e q f X and the axiom of pairing was used in the definition of the subset P 1 display style P underscore 1 Topic. Reception of the argument Initially, Cantor's theory was controversial among mathematicians and later philosophers. As Leopold Kronecker claimed, I don't know what predominates in Cantor's theory, philosophy or theology, but I am sure that there is no mathematics there. 
Many mathematicians agreed with Kronecker that the completed infinite may be part of philosophy or theology, but that it has no proper place in mathematics. Logician Wilfred Hodges has commented on the energy devoted to refuting this harmless little argument, i.e. Cantor's diagonal argument asking, what had it done to anyone to make them angry with it? Others have also taken issue with Cantor's proof regarding the cardinality of the power set. Mathematician Solomon Pfefferman has referred to Cantor's theories as simply not relevant to everyday mathematics. Before Cantor, the notion of infinity was often taken as a useful abstraction which helped mathematicians reason about the finite world, for example, the use of infinite limit cases in calculus. The infinite was deemed to have at most a potential existence, rather than an actual existence. Actual infinity does not exist. What we call infinite is only the endless possibility of creating new objects no matter how many exist already. Carl Friedrich Gauss's views on the subject can be paraphrased as, infinity is nothing more than a figure of speech which helps us talk about limits. The notion of a completed infinity doesn't belong in mathematics. In other words, the only access we have to the infinite is through the notion of limits, and hence, we must not treat infinite sets as if they have an existence exactly comparable to the existence of finite sets. Cantor's ideas ultimately were largely accepted, strongly supported by David Hilbert, amongst others. Hilbert predicted no one will drive us from the paradise which Cantor created for us." To which Wittgenstein replied, "...if one person can see it as a paradise of mathematicians, why should not another see it as a joke?" The rejection of Cantor's infinitary ideas influenced the development of schools of mathematics such as constructivism and intuitionism. Topic. Objection to the axiom of infinity A common objection to Cantor's theory of infinite number involves the axiom of infinity which is, indeed, an axiom and not a logical truth. Maybury has noted that the set theoretical axioms that sustain modern mathematics are self-evident in differing degrees. One of them, Indeed, the most important of them, namely Cantor's axiom, the so-called axiom of infinity, has scarcely any claim to self-evidence at all. Another objection is that the use of infinite sets is not adequately justified by analogy to finite sets. Hermann Weyl wrote, Classical logic was abstracted from the mathematics of finite sets and their subsets. Forgetful of this limited origin, one afterwards mistook that logic for something above and prior to all mathematics, and finally applied it, without justification, to the mathematics of infinite sets. This is the fall and original sin of Cantor's set theory. The difficulty with finitism is to develop foundations of mathematics using finitist assumptions, that incorporates what everyone would reasonably regard as mathematics for example, that includes real analysis. See also Preintuitionism equals equals notes